You know, I, I believe what John was saying at the end is true for all of us. Some of us are aware of how desperate we are for Christ to meet us in this place, and some of us are not. But it doesn't make it any less true whether we're in touch with that or we aren't. We're in a place of, of need. And I just want, before I open the Scriptures and teach this morning, for us to just maybe, if we're not already, just to maybe try and open and get a little bit more in touch with that need for us personally. Because your need and my need, they may differ in ways, but they're, they're needs nonetheless. And when we can be honest in the presence of God about our need and open to Him, from places of our desperation, He meets us. And that's what we want today, right? We don't, we don't just go through the motions of going to church because it's where we're supposed to be. We want to meet the risen and living God and have Him meet us in the place where we most need to be met. We are desperate, whether we know it or not. So let's pray, and then we'll open the Scriptures, and I'm going to share with you some things that I'm learning. Lord, for those of us who are not really in touch with how much we need you, would you, by your mercy and grace, move upon our hearts and our minds so that light could break through and we could understand that, Lord, it's more than just okay, it's right to open to you in this space and in this space to be vulnerable and in this space to receive what you have for us for us to be here this morning. So let, let us, by your grace, for those who aren't in touch, to become in touch with our need. And for those who are deeply in need and are desperate for you, in a very same way, would you meet us in that? And would you not even what we think we need, but what we really need? and what you know we need. Would you do that for us in what time remains? The kingdom would come here in this room and your will be done in this place as it is in the heavens. In Christ we pray. Amen. So I was reading a story this week about some archaeologists who were digging uh, in some old Roman ruins. And over time they had come across tens of hundreds of these prayer tablets. Tablets that people paid to have written down and then kept in posterity. And these tablets um, of that time and day were the most common according to what the article was saying. And these prayer tablets were called cursing tablets. Cursing tablets. Um, in other words, people who had been hurt would pay a certain amount of money to the gods, and they would have written on the inscription, X person hurt me, this is how they hurt me, this is what I want you to do to them. <laughs> right? Yeah, true. <laughs> Tens of hundreds of these tablets were discovered. I want to read for you a simple example. This is, I'm not making this up. This is true. This is what was written uh, cursing tablets. I invoke you, holy angels and holy names, to tie up, block, strike, overthrow, harm, destroy, kill, and shatter you Charios, the charioteer, and all of his horses tomorrow in the arena of Rome. Let the starting gates not open properly. Let him not compete quickly. Let him not pass. Let him not make the turn properly. Let him not receive the honors. Let him not squeeze over and overpower. Let him not come from behind and pass, but instead let him collapse 
Let him be bound, let him be broken up, and let him drag behind, both in the early races and in the later ones, just in case the gods were confused about which races they wanted this to happen. In other words, this was the prayer to the gods. You chariot hurt me badly. I want him hurt worse. He hurt me. I hate him. Punish him. Now let me give you another category of prayer. This is called the Bless My Enemy tablet. Imagine finding one that would read, You Cheerios hurt me badly. Would you deliver me from my resentment? Would you help you Cheerios find genuine repentance? Would you forgive his sin and mine? And would you heal our relationship? How many bless your enemy tablets do you think that the archaeologists discovered? Because there were no such things. In a world where um, people were ennobled by um, their self-righteousness and their need for justice, um, oftentimes what you would find as they uh, moved through uh, these ruins were tablets of people who were wanting revenge because they had been hurt. But they didn't find any tablets of forgiveness because that ethic didn't exist until a carpenter from a very small town of Nazareth stepped into a world that had this ethic. Okay? Okay? And this carpenter, Jesus, would speak into this culture of unforgiveness and cursing and judgments. He would speak into that culture and say to them, you have heard it said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Now, oftentimes when you hear that quoted, you don't hear the end of that, and this is a very important part of that talk. Does anybody know what comes next in that statement? You have heard it said that you are to love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you, you may become children of your Father in heaven. So in other words, this is how those of us who align ourselves our Heavenly Father, not Zeus, not Apollos, not Athena, not Poseidon. But this is what those of us who align ourselves with this one and true God live like. And so this carpenter stepped into this world of cursing tablets and he spoke these words. And he turned that ethic on its head. Now how strange is this ethic? when you walk into a world that I just described, tens of hundreds of tablets in the old Roman ruins that they found of people who were paying money so that their enemies would be in some way harmed. It's a different ethic. And I want to look a little bit more at that. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. We've been in a series called Close Encounters. We're moving towards the end. Next week we'll finish that on Easter where we've been looking at these dynamics of those people who encountered Christ and whose lives were somehow made different because of that encounter. Something changed. Now, when perfect love comes your way, you can respond to it in a number of ways. You don't have to open to it. You can resist it, and we've seen that. Just because you have a great opportunity doesn't mean you're going to seize it or make the most of it. Sometimes from our places of pain, and sometimes from our places of hurt, when real love comes our way, we don't know what to do with it, and we resist it. And we're the worst for it. Now, when we last left Jesus last week, he was pleading on his face in the garden, asking for his Father to remove the cup of suffering from him. For an hour or more, he pleaded with his Father, and yet he came to a place of surrender, and of submission to his Father's will, and he, 
He said, even in spite of what I want, if what I want isn't what you want, then I yield to that. And we talked about how important that is for you and I when we get to a place that we do need to express with the full weight and range of our emotions the things that we desire, the things that we want, the things that we hope for. But at some point, to come to some place of holy indifference where we can relinquish that, ask God our Father to give us what we most need. Well, just at the end of where we stopped last week, Jesus got up, engaged his disciples who had been sleeping on him over and over and over, three different times. And just about the last time that he got up and engaged them, Judas, the one who was betraying him, arrived with soldiers. Now, we didn't get there last week, and we're going to kind of fast forward through that. But Judas, the one who would betray him, one of his closest friends who had lived and walked and talked and witnessed his great works for a period of three years, was now betraying him into the hands of his enemies. And they took him by force. Later that night, as they took him to a place called the Praetorium, he would be judged unjustly. And after his judgment by Pilate, he would be not only mocked, and stripped, but he would be flogged, he would be beaten and tortured beyond recognition. So much so that by the time they took him out the following day, the following morning, to a garbage dump outside the city of Jerusalem and hung him on a cross, he would be largely unrecognizable. This is the one who said, you have heard it said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, Love your enemy and pray for those who flog you, who mock you, who torture you, who kill you. See, this wasn't just an ethic that he ascribed to philosophically. He gave himself to this even unto death because it was, it was the way to life. And that's what I want us to look at. And so, in Luke 23... He and the other two criminals who will be on both sides will find themselves being crucified on a garbage dump outside the city of Jerusalem. Now when we, when we read this text, I want you to just pay attention to things that stand out to you. For any of you who have, who have been at this church or any other church, you, you are familiar with this story. And so... But I want you to hear it as if you're hearing it for the first time. And I want you to think about what stands out, what maybe even surprises you when you listen to this very familiar story. Okay, so Luke 23, beginning in verse 32. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. Came to a place called the Skull... They nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched, and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now I want you to think about what you notice, what surprises you, what stands out. And I'm going to share with you a few things that stood out to me as I was reading. Normally, kings sit on thrones. 
It's what we would expect of all monarchs. They are treated royally. So when we look at this king, it surprises me that what is reserved for this king is not a throne, but a cross. This king is being humiliated. This king is being nailed to a tree and publicly mocked. And I thought to myself as I'm reading this text this week, what kind of king occupies a cross and not a throne? And it made me begin to think through the rest of the story. What kind of king? What kind of king? What kind of king? As I continue through the story, it doesn't surprise me that there are some people there who are mocking him. Some people, they didn't get it. They are ignorant of who he was and what he was there for. And so these claims that he made and these things that he did, now he finds himself there and they're mocking him. But what does surprise me just a little bit and what I can't really fathom is that while there are those who are hurling insults, there are soldiers at the base of his cross who are gambling, they're playing dice to get his clothes. What kind of people do that? What kind of people show up to the execution of an individual and just as they're flipping the switch are gambling for whatever his leftovers are? as millions of volts are shot through his body. What, what, what kind of people do such a thing? And what would they do with his clothes that went to the winner? What, are they going to put it on like Craigslist or eBay and try and make money off the deal or what? Are they going to, are they going to, how could they possibly get it out? They're not going to wear it. What would, it's such a mockery that they're playing games at the base of a cross of a king who is dying for them. Because as they're playing these games, he's crying out to his father to forgive them. They didn't even ask for it. They didn't even want it. But he's given it to them anyway. What kind of king gives forgiveness to those who mock him and don't even want it? What kind of king... As I continue through the story, I was thinking about moving through this text and realizing that one on one side is like taunting him and the other on the other side is like indignant. How, how can you say these things to such a man? I mean, we're here because we deserve to be. He doesn't deserve to be here. And it strikes me, not that the criminal would reach out in one last ditch effort to receive help and hope in the place of his need, that happens a lot of times, doesn't it? When you reach the absolute end of your rope and there's nothing else left, there's a lot of like prison house conversions, right? There are. Because they are desperate and they know it. And so what strikes me is not that he reaches for help, but what strikes me is what he asked for. He doesn't ask to be rescued. Right? Everybody else is taunting him. If you are who you say you are, then save yourself and save us too. He doesn't ask for that. He doesn't ask to be taken down. He knows that he's getting what he deserved. He doesn't ask to be rescued. He does not ask for revenge. He's not writing a cursing tablet. He does not want on the heads of his enemies for them to receive the same or in some way more. He doesn't ask for that. All he asks is what? To be remembered. That's it. It's a humble request. That's what he wants. That's all he wants. And what amazes me is that this king would give him that and more. Because he says, not only will I remember you, but you will be my guest in paradise. You will join me this day in a rule, in a realm, in a place where all things are different than they are here. What kind of king would do such a thing? Only a king who would refuse to conform to the standards of the society around him. 
only a king who will not be governed by its limited vision of worthiness and its truncated version of justice. What kind of king? Only a king who is not content to rule from afar, but who needs to draw close and from a place of nearness come to us in our weakness and pain and give us what we most need. Only a king who is willing to embrace all, forgive all, redeem all. Only a king who is willing to do these things because it is in the truest nature of who he is. That's the kind of king. At the cross, things are turned on their head. Nothing will ever be the same. From this point on, everything we thought we knew about kings and kingdoms gets turned on its head here. Surprised or not surprised, Jesus invites and welcomes not only those who mourn with him, but those who mock him. And he promises them a different realm, a different place where all things will be just and fair and made whole. Now this insults our sensibilities on some level. Because we think, well, forgiveness is offered to those who are repentant. No. Forgiveness is offered to everyone. Forgiveness is offered to everyone. The question becomes, will I open to that offer and receive it? Because I can resist it if it's offered to me or not. Whether I deserve it or not. Who deserves it? Really? That's not the question. Because Christ our King knows that none of us really deserve it. But He also knows that we all desperately need it. And so, when the thief on the cross reaches out and asks to be remembered, Jesus gives him more than what he asks for. And as he gives it to, them, to him, he extends an invitation to us. To those among us who have come to places where there is darkness in us that needs to be penetrated and illumined. He offers to those of us who have settled down into living in a world and in a realm where we would be more content to write a cursing tablet than a blessing tablet. He knows from the places of your deepest pain what you most need. The question really for you and I in this space is, do we really know what we most need? Because sometimes we can fight and resist and push against the things that we think we deserve, when in fact we stand in a place of need no different than those who mourn with him or mock him. And so when we think about this text, one of the things that I was thinking this week is that all that really is necessary for someone like you or I is that we understand where it is that we are and what it is that we need and cry out for it. The only thing that separates the one from the left than the right is not the level of their crime. It's the recognition of their need. And you and I, no matter how much we grow and mature and move forward in this life, we will always have some gap between where we are and where we want to be. Always. And the gap may be a canyon or it may be just a small space, but we will always have some space of need. And we have to determine what we're willing to do in that place of need. You see, because that love that is offered, right? That unconditional, transforming love that is offered comes at a great cost. Right? What did it cost Christ to give this to us? 
It cost him his life. It cost him everything. So, should we think as followers of his that it will cost us any less? We all want to be recipients of this kind of transforming, forgiving, redeeming, holistic grace and love that is offered to us. We all want that. But our cross becomes the place where our need, right, meets our indifference to the place of likeness to Christ. There are some things that need us today. Because they're standing in the way of our receiving what we most need. The, the thief here makes a case for humility. And I would submit to you that there's a place in our lives where we need that to be mightily at play in us. Because there are things in our lives that aren't when, when looked at, right? There are things in our lives that don't match up in likeness to Christ. We are followers of His, many of us. But there are things in our lives that we are holding on to that are preventing us from receiving what He has for us and for giving it to those who need. Because that's what happens, right? When you receive that kind of mercy and grace, when you are remembered and you are invited and you are welcomed to live in a, rule, in a place where, where everything is different than what you thought you knew, when you're invited into that space, you can't bring extra things with you. Leave the cursing tablets at the door. I know we can identify with some of those tablets they found in the Roman ruins. I know that, right? We can identify with that. Jesus stepped into that world. He stepped into our world. And he says, you know what? That's not my way. That's not my way. That way leads to death. That way leads to hardness of heart. It leads to bitterness of spirit. It leads you to becoming like the very people you're wanting to curse. But I say to you, love that person. Forgive that person. Restore that person. And pray for that person. Why? So that you may become children of your Father whose rule and realm... Remember remember when we talked about the kingdom of God as that rule or that realm where everything is as God wants it to be? That's how God wants it to be. Yahweh is different than Zeus. Different than Athena. Different than Poseidon. Different than any of the other gods and goddesses that you know. So different. so different that he would give his son for you and for me and he would give his life but not just that you would receive that grace in the place of your need and not just that you would do it once but that you would receive that grace that mercy that love as often as is needed and how often is that? Just about all the time. And when you receive that love, and you begin to allow that kind of love to find its home in you, and you begin to appropriate that in the places of your life that most need it, then, 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 you can give it away. Because there's an endless supply. So you don't have to hoard it. And you don't have to worry that you're going to run out. And you don't have to be stingy with it. You can give it away. To who? To the people who don't even know that they need it. To the people who will mock you for giving it to them. 
for the very people who will put you in the places of your own need for death. And so, from our places of pain, we know that to receive that love, all is needed for us as a place of deep humility that says, remember me. Maybe that's our prayer this week. Lord, remember me. Not, not, not would you get me to this place? Would you do this for me? Would you, nah. -uh. Would you take revenge? Would you get them? Would you, nah. -uh. Lord, would you remember me today? And he will say, oh, I'll do more than that. I'll not only remember you, I, I will welcome you into a new place where you can live differently. And as I usher you into that place, I want to I welcome and invite you to bring others with you. Why? Because everyone needs it. Because that is the rule of the realm that my Father lives in and wants to be. That's the place that we're helping to usher in. When you pray that prayer I taught you, the Lord's Prayer, and we walk through that and we look at that, when we pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, what we're asking for is for that realm to come down here and for you to live in and for you to invite others to live with you. Lord, remember me. This very day, he says, you will be with me in paradise. Paradise? That place where everything is as God wants it to be. So let me just ask you, from the place of your pain today, from the deep places of your hurt, from the places in your life that are most out of alignment with Christ. Because that's usually where our deepest pain is. Those places in our life that are most out of alignment with Christ and His way. You may not think of that, but it is really true. For In those places of alignment, when we are connected, when we are abiding, when we are residing, dwelling with the One who saves, heals, redeems, delivers. When we're in that space, no matter what's going on in our life, there is peace of mind and heart. There is deep and abiding joy. There is love for those who don't love us. When we're in that place of alignment, so the places of our deepest pain are those places that we are most out of alignment. And so in that place of pain, where, where do you need Him to remember you today? Not fix, not change, not get even, not... Where do you need to be remembered? That really becomes your prayer, not only this morning, but as you leave this space. Lord, where am I? Where am I not right with you? Where are things just not as they should be in me? Because if we want to live in a world, in a realm where things are as God wants them to be, and, and we want that, right? Then that has to happen with us. We can't want to live in a place where it's not happening in us. It's got to be happening in us first so that we can then bring that kingdom to others. I can't bring you a kingdom I'm not residing in. Right? I've got to live in that space. Lord, remember me. Remember me. Sick. And I am stuck. And I am addicted. And I am not right in my head and in my heart. I am broken. I am afraid. I am angry. Where's that space where you're not in alignment? Remember me. The only thing that stands between any one of us, all of us have need, is our willingness to be humble and invite Christ into that space. That's it. Because He forgives everybody. 
even the people who gamble at the base of his cross for his clothes. Mourners and mockers, he forgives everybody. The only thing that stands in the way of anybody receiving that forgiveness, that grace, is their opening to it. What is the place of your need? Where are you most out of alignment with the will of God in your life? Okay? And understand this. As soon as you ask him to remember you, he will. It doesn't have to be a complex, convoluted prayer. It's a simple prayer, isn't it? Would you remember me? And boy, will he. And as you mature, then you can begin to ask him, would you help me here? I can't stand this person. And I want them like you Cheerios to have miserable failure in their life. And that person might seem to be your enemy. That person might even be in your family. To wish someone ill is not in alignment. That's why you feel so badly. To make judgments against someone is not in alignment with what God wants for you. So when you're outside of that place, that's why you feel so... It's why you can't find sleep. It's why you're getting ulcers. It's why you have headaches and neck pain. Because you're holding on to stuff that just shouldn't be there. I'm asking you, I'm inviting you into a different realm. What kind of king institutes this realm? The kind of king we've just finished reading about. And he invites you to join him. And you say, that sounds great. Sign me up. Right? Here's the last piece and we'll close with this. The thing is, and why most people don't sign up for this, is because it will cost you everything. You will have to break the neck of your pride over and over and over again. Humility comes at a great cost. Surrender and sacrifice and yieldedness to the will of God, it will cost you your life. But I, I just have to tell you something. The life that you're clinging on to that's out of alignment with the will of God, it's not worth having anyway. So you're holding on to something so desperately and you're hoping God will get on your side. Right? You don't follow Christ to have Him get where you're going. You follow Christ to get where He's going. And so, so, so now I reframe it. You have this great gift, this wonderful offer. It requires some humility. But you just need to know that if you accept this offer, you will have to lay down your old self. Not once, not twice, every day, all the time. Because probably before you get out of these doors, you are going to be tested in a space where you are not in alignment with Christ. And you're going to have to make a decision as to what kind of world, what kind of realm you want to reside in. And if you want the kind that I've been speaking to, it has to first begin in you. This word today, if you take it at face value, will cause you when you leave here to have to do many courageous things. And, and I'm sure you're not going to want to do them. Why do I know that? Because I don't want to do them. <laughs> I mean. There is a different world order that Jesus came to help usher in. And once he does it in our hearts, he can use us to help usher it into other people's worlds. And that's the kind of world that I want to inhabit. Not just when I die but between here and the time that I die. I do believe in eternity. I believe in a richer realm beyond what we know now. But in this place, in this space that we call life, I'm not just mailing it in. I want the best of what God has for me until I hit that space and move forward.
Don't you? I'm not just marking time, man. I want the kingdom of God. When I pray that prayer, I mean it. But mostly I'm just thinking about myself and how much I really need it and where I am in a Because I can't give you something that I don't have. But when I have it, I can give it completely because I know that there's an endless store and it replenishes itself as I give it out. Lord, would you remember me in the space that I most need to be remembered? Don't fix, change. Get on my side and do what I want you to do. Just bring me into alignment with you that I might do what you want me to do. That's our prayer. So let's pray it. Lord, would you remember me? Do you remember us? In the places of our greatest desperation. In the places where we've tried to fix ourselves and fix others too. What a joke that we would fix others when we can't ourselves. For all the answers that we think we have, for all the knowledge that we think we possess, there's still hardness of heart towards people that just shouldn't be. Would you help us this day to receive what you want to give us? What a king. In this space, would something change inside of us? That we would this very day inhabit paradise. That rule, that realm, that place where things are as you want them to be. As you do, would you give us the courage to be willing to die to everything that keeps us from aligning fully with your will. Even if like Christ in the garden, we don't want it, if you know we need it, would you help us to let go and to trust you daily deaths. Trust you. That your kingdom will come. That your will be done. On this earth. As it is in the heavens. And all God's people pray. Amen.